<clears throat> so back then, self-defense, that's what we did, and some sparring, that's what we had. Now we have self-defense, combatant fighting, third-party protection. In each, we have uh, technical, tactical, physical, and mental, especially mental aspects, mental training, mental preparation. Uh, it's sort of a pyramid that has four sections or four sides, and you cannot live without one of the sides, obviously, mm -hmm. but the mental is most important. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today I'm joined by Eyal Yanilov. Did it, did, how'd I do? Very good. Awesome. Awesome. Stick around. We're going to have a great chat. I appreciate you being here. If you happen to be new to what we do here at Martial Arts Radio, please check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode we've ever done, we've got transcripts and links, photos and videos, all kinds of great stuff over there. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can get in all the behind the scenes stuff. All of that is free. Keep that in mind. Why do we do it? To connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. Now, if you want to know all the things we do as an organization, you can go to whistlekick.com. Everything from apparel to events. I just flew back late the other two, two days ago, just over a day ago from an event that we did. Great time. If you were there, you know. If you weren't there, well, maybe you can come to one of the next ones. So whistlekick.com. But Back to today, back to this, this episode. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I thought you were talking about the audience. Oh, no, well, <laughs> I, I appreciate that being here too, but I appreciate yes. you being here. Thanks for making the time. Yeah. yeah, I'm in Israel before flying away another time. So about 200 days a year, I'm outside Israel. Too but now I'm at home, so it's an opportunity. Nice. Nice. Well, I'm glad the timing worked out. I'm glad we were able to, to talk cool. with you. And if, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a friend who lived in, who lives in Scotland that connected us with you. You were doing a seminar in Scotland. Does that, does that make sense? I believe so. Yes. Okay. I was in Scotland uh, okay. a month ago. Okay. So 200 days a year, is there anywhere you haven't gone? Well, of course. Yes. But we are operating in about 60 countries, and I've been in most of them. Uh, yes. So. Is there anywhere you want to go that you haven't been? The truth is I have enough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have such a large organization. So yeah. if I, in, I don't manage to see everyone or every country uh, uh, even once in two years. There are countries that I go more than others, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been, you've been at this a while, right? So maybe what we should do, we should talk about why you're traveling and how you ended up in that role. So, um, if anybody's watching, they can see your shirt, KMG, Krav Maga Global. Yeah. And what, what is that organization? Okay. So actually you asked a couple of questions. So Krav Maga Global is an organization, which is spreading the knowledge, the, I would say the more advanced one of Krav Maga and the real one uh, in the world as much as possible to the largest number of people as possible. People like us, people who are uh, uh, with high level of integrity, we are trying to, to find those or that those will come to us. Uh, people who need it for, from you know, self-esteem to special forces. Mm. So that, that's, that's the idea. And, I've been doing Krav Maga for 50 years this year wow. and uh, teaching yeah, 49, you know, something like this. <laughs> I became as a, as a teenager, I was assistant instructor and the first instructor course with the founder that I took uh, was in uh, 1976. Hmm. Were you alive then? Oh, 75, sorry. Okay. No. So, but uh, this is the, this is the no, advantage. You missed me by a couple years, 79. <laughs> okay, good. Cool. So, um, and then, you know, things happen in life. You plan things. From the age of 10, I was sure that I'll be an engineer. When I finished uh, electrical engineering, I decided, hey, I would like to do masters in, in, in electrical engineering, but I would like to do some other stuff. So I started working with special forces. Mm -hmm. That was 85, 1985. Um, 
so when I finished uh, with this, uh, uh, let's say, idea, with the time, and in 1994, uh, uh, I started doing only Maga. Mm. Um, before that, it was Maga, it was study, it was uh, some, some other work with, which were involved engineering and marketing and managing. But uh, since, you know, 94, so 30 years ago, I started uh, spreading the system in the world. Um, I was the closest uh, assistant to the founder for about 20 years, close to 20 years. I just, you know, I was in the right place in time, in time obviously, with uh, some capabilities, for sure, yes. And uh, my role was to make Krav Maga a system. Imi, the founder, he was a genius in giving the best solution for a specific problem, and with the years, he became better. Mm. And my job was to take it, to show the principles, the, to make the training methods, to make the variations, to make it tactical and strategical, and integrate everything. This was my So without him, I would be nothing, and definitely not here, either would you, at least with, together. <laughs> And uh, but uh, let's say he bought his child and took it to kindergarten and first second grade. We are now maybe in the masters, maybe going to PhD okay. with the Krav Maga. Yeah, so okay. it doesn't sound to me like it's a coincidence that you went to school as an engineer and then you applied those that that sort of approach to Krav Maga. Sure. You you developed into sure. a, in, into a system. Yes. That yes. makes sense. Systematical thinking, system thinking, principles. Yeah. Think, you know, engineering, if it works, don't touch it. <laughs> so whatever worked, we just did things uh, uh, around it. What didn't work or we found something better, we did a better thing. And like this, uh, we developed. Sometimes there was a revolution. For example, in, the, in 84, we did a revolution. In 87, we did revolutions. Uh, but after that, mainly evolution with the time, uh, make it more, um, let's say, tactical, make it more integrated, make it uh, three components. In initially with Imi, Imi, the founder, yes, um, he taught us self-defense and he taught us techniques. This is the problem, here's the solution. This is the problem, this is the solution. You can say that there's a, a big C, with few islands or many islands. Mm. And then to make it a system, then we start uh, making bridges between the islands and then bridges between the bridges. Eventually put some more land. So wherever you put your leg, it's solid. Mm. So something like this, I would say, what happened um, in, in, in our world of, of uh, Krav Maga. Um, yes. You mentioned a couple revolutions. Uh, I think you said 1984 yes. and 1987. We're at no, a time. No, 84, 84, 87. 84, First rule, yes, yes. We're at a time now where, in a lot of martial arts, there are there are some big conversations that mm -hmm. could be the beginning of revolutions. What what were the revolutionary things that happened in Krav Maga at those times? Okay, so. I would say it was making, uh, taking principles, showing how principles apply in the different techniques. So we say now, I mean, things passed, yes? Yeah? So now what we are saying about what happened there is just, this was the beginning. That was the beginning. Right. Understanding the uh, principles behind what we are doing. And <clears throat> so back then, self-defense, that's what we did, and some sparring. That's what we had. Now we have self-defense, combatant fighting, third-party protection. In each, we have uh, technical, tactical, physical, and mental, especially mental aspects, mental training, mental preparation. Uh, it's sort of a pyramid that has four sections or four sides, and you cannot live without one of the sides, obviously, mm -hmm. but the mental is most important. We didn't have this uh, back then. We didn't have third-party protection back then, only very glimpse of it, very little. Uh, there were no principles, so that's we introduced the principles. With the principles, we had um, the understanding of 
the hierarchy within the subject in the system. What I mean is this. For example, we have a fist as a tool, or we have a forearm as a tool. Then with this tool, you do a specific technique. The straight punch can be a specific technique. The outside defense can be a specific technique. And then this technique has specific uh, principles behind it. Uh, this and components behind the technique. For example, in this uh, outside defense, there's the forearm motion, the shoulder motion, the body motion may go in the, the counter attack at the same time. It is some sort of a basic for us. Mm -hmm. Or in the straight punch, we have the cl clench of the fist, how we are opening two uh, joints and make a straight punch, how we are turning the body, how we are shifting the weight, how we are crunching, lowering the back shoulder, things like this that are uh, increasing the uh, kinetic chain, the impact of your strike. Um, so this is the, the, the components within. And then we started do, doing variations. With Imi, in Imi's times, there were no variation. In these defenses, this is one and this is two, this is three, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. Like we have seven techniques here. And we it reminds are, me of if, Filipino martial arts, right, with the, with the numbers. In a way, yes, in a way, yes. But sometimes they have, I, I'm not so familiar with this, I'm a little bit familiar, so they have different type of stabs, and every stab has a number, right? Something like this. This In is what systems, I know. Yeah. Yes, okay. So uh, um, so for us, it will be, you know, there some, there'll be some names for that, but that's a straight punch. Mm -hmm. So then we have the straight punch, but then we can have the straight punch in sitting, and in lying down, and in movement, and we have the left and the right, and we have combinations, and we have a tactic of fake, and then make a straight punch. So this is the the where it started to go even back then. Mm. So this was the revolution going from techniques to principles to variations, um, and a little bit about scenarios. Uh, another thing that happened back then is I uh, uh, organized really developed, you can say, developed and organized. And uh, you see, there's a saying, there's nothing new under the sun, but the way it's being done and the way it's being uh, formed is definitely somehow new. Yes? Mm -hmm. So all the fighting tactics, we organized the fighting tactics uh, in, in groups. Uh, for example, something that I can tell you is rhythm. I've never seen anybody is doing rhythm the, place, the way we explain and work with it. Um, could, could you if you want an example, yeah. yes, I can give you an example. Um, so let me uh, be like Phil Collins, drumming a little bit. So this is the first uh, rhythm is called not connected. Some time passes between one and the other. Mm -hmm. Then we have, so this is a strike and then another strike. Okay. Um, uh, some time passes between. So next time I'll see you, I punch you, and the uh, year after, when I see you again, I've, this with many students of mine, I punch you again. Of course, you'll do defenses, obviously, <laughs> but uh, a year passed. Okay. Uh, but of course, sometimes a fraction of a second uh, uh, passes. The next one is called natural. So this is the natural rhythm. This is the natural rhythm. The natural rhythm is when this one returns, who uh, rather close to the body, the second one goes. Mm -hmm. This is very common in almost all the martial arts. The next one is called shattered, or, excuse me, broken. Broken rhythm is the next one. Broken rhythm, people are talking about this, most not doing it. The broken rhythm is this one, which means when I start recalling the first, the second one goes. Mm -hmm. That's a broken rhythm. You have to do it with the kicks. You have to do it with a strike uh, uh, and a kick. We have to. We can do it with a defense and a, and a, and a counter attack, et a defense and a kick, etc. So it's about movements. It's not about techniques of attacks only. And then the next one is a shattered rhythm. The shattered rhythm is when the first one hits the target, the second one is halfway on the, to the target, mm. or to another target. So then it, it, it sounds like Monty Python, this one, okay? So this is the shattered rhythm. And it goes this way. 
uh, of course, the only one that I can see it a little bit being done is Wing Chun. They have got this uh, chain, uh, maybe they call it chain punching, something like this. It is something, but we have it in all across the board, which means with the defenses, with the attacks, with the counterattacks, and with defenses, with the kicks and the punches, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So this is called one and a quarter for us. The broken rhythm was one and a half. This is one and a quarter. And then there's the simultaneous. Simultaneous can be two strikes at the same time, a defense and counterattack at the same time, punch and kick at the same time, hit with a stick and kick at the same time. You know, these type of uh, things. Uh, this, so we have five rhythms. So this example. If you heard it before, tell me. I, I've, heard, I've heard bits of this, and, and, and exactly. what you're saying makes sense. And I've, I've trained it, and I've witnessed it, but as you started with, I've never heard it explained this way. Okay, so it this, this is so our sense. Yeah, it's, so this is our our application of how it works. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is our one of our advantages, except of the knowledge, and this the explanation, the analyzing, the understanding of the uh, situation much more, the area much more, the behaviors of the aggressor, the natural response of the trainee. All well, these things. Uh, 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 this. this is just an example, but we have, for example, fakes. When you think about fakes, fake in direction, fake in speed, fake in height, combinations of different fakes, or integrating different fakes. This is just an example of another family of uh, tactics. And then we have the tactics in the self-defense that was, unfortunately, not really during Emi's times, although we showed a couple of place, uh, times, a couple of uh, situations, I mean, and then uh, uh, things according to timeline. Uh, do I have... You know what is the OODA loop? I've heard... I've it's heard uh, observe, term. okay, observe, orientate, uh, decide and act. It's mainly for, uh, for pilots. It was designed in the US for pilots. Uh, like they need to uh, observe where they are, uh, they orientate where they are, or observe where they are, decide and, and, and then do something. Um, so for us, it is definitely just a piece of what we do, but uh, we need to process, we need to sense, because we're not only visual, we're not pilot. Uh, we need to sense what is happening, or not only with the vision, uh, uh, with the hearing, hearing, with the contact, etc., etc. So th we have a timeline for event. For example, somebody approaches me uh, uh, to attack me or to talk to me or whatever, let's say something simple, approaches to attacks, so what I can do in the very long range, how can I prevent and avoid this, uh, this type of uh, situation. What happens if I didn't identify this? What happens if it's the, not the very long range, only the long range? Maybe I can uh, uh, run away. Maybe I can throw something. Maybe I can uh, uh, throw a table, over, 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 over throw, over throw, over throw. Uh, uh, a table. Maybe I can uh, kick the person, you know, different distances. I can do different things. Maybe I'm sitting in a, sitting in a chair. I can use the chair or just run away. Then when it is more surprising, I need to do, maybe I can do simultaneous counterattacking, defend and counterattack simultaneously. And then when I'm more surprised, I can do simultaneous, I can do something else, et cetera, et cetera, until I'm very much surprised. Or I'm, let's say I'm on the way to the ground. How do I behave on the way to the ground? Or what happened if I was taken to the ground? Uh, and if the aggressor is standing or uh, uh, if the aggressor is tied to me? You know, things like this that are very, very relevant, and you can say there is a timeline. It's not really a line because there, there are it can be branches also. Uh, so uh, this, this have been another sort of. I'm not sure it's something between evolution and revolution uh, that we did later stages. Um, so th these are a few examples about about this. And then uh, in uh, 87, 88, I did the let's say the curriculum of the new system. Let's say. Um, and so this was, uh, back then we already started teaching in the U.S. So U.S., the first instructor course in the U for the U.S. people was in Israel in 81. I taught it, uh, and then the guys went back. A few of them uh, started groups, built organizations, uh, 
One of them is Kamaga Worldwide, although we are not in contact for many years. They even sued me once, <laughs> but that's another issue. And then uh, the one or two are still active, not really in organization. But uh, it was this was the beginning of spreading Kav Maga. And then in in uh, the the 80s. Uh, we, we understood a little bit more about the system and making a system. And in the mid-90s, I started spreading Krav Maga in the world. So this was another sort of evolution, in a way. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Was, was spreading this globally part of Imi's vision? Did he, yeah, Imi did had he a dream. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Imi had a dream that uh, Krav Maga will be taught by everyone. But will be yeah will be learned by everyone yes, um, every woman, uh, man, and young person should know how to defend themselves. But that's a dream. Uh, he didn't do it, as we say. He bore this child. He took it to the kindergarten and first few grades. He didn't do that. Uh, he tried. He didn't manage. But uh, again, these it, things. Some things take more than a lifetime, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, um, I, I took it upon myself. And again, in, in the beginning, I just did it. But then there was a switch. I'll do only this. This is a mission in life. So even a mission in life, you sometimes you awaken into it. When someone says that something is a mission, it suggests big experiences or... or something, something happened that made you want to invest your life in this, especially, you know, it's not like you were, you were uh, learning another martial art and that was your job. You were on path to be an electrical engineer. That's a very different life yes. than this one. Yes. What, what happened? How, how does that happen? How do you make that switch? So first of all, it's several coincidences, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So a few coincidences is one thing. Uh, your friends and teachers is one, another thing. Mm -hmm. Your enemies is another thing. They're willing to sacrifice. It's, it's, it's just to make it clear. If, if you ma Are you married? No. No. Okay, so you didn't sacrifice all the marriages to all the other women yet. Mm. I got married. I sacrificed all the marriages to other people. Especially women. <laughs> <laughs> it's just no big, I, today with the work and the gender policy, politics is, uh, yes. Uh, so, yes. So, uh, and if I choose to do a profession like engineering, I definitely couldn't do Krav Maga the way I do it. The moment I did, I chose Krav Maga to do, uh, then I sacrificed my engineering. Practically completely. The only thing I do at home, sometimes I switch a light bulb. I switch uh, all things like this, yes. <laughs> Maybe something more, but still not much more. Uh, so th this is this is a sacrifice. It's obvious. And then things went. Uh, uh, I went to the special forces. I worked there, anti-terror, anti undercover people. I worked there for several years. Then things changed. I had enough on one hand, and they uh, wanted to change something there with the manpower. So I, I finished that job. I went to. Um, I went to the master's in electrical engineering. Uh, um, the laser broke down. I, did, I made a mistake in plus and minus in one of the tests. I got uh, fed up with this after a couple of years. Uh, they didn't think that I was good enough. I didn't want to do this. I got enough. So it's, it's combinations like this. Uh, I was head of the, the um, professional committee of the Israeli Kalmaga Association, the first organization that IMI built. So I was practically number two after Amy professionally. Uh, How old were you at that time? This I, I was nominated in '87. I was 28 years old. That's that's young yes. for that sort of role. Yes, it is. It is. It is. He didn't have somebody better. That's it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, and then some years after. Uh, there was a clashes within the organization, no politics, and it was an association, a uh, so sport association. It was impossible to work with this organization. So I went out with some of my uh, trainees, 
some of my students, people who trained with me several years. Can, can, we, can we talk about that a, a little bit? The, the, yes, because definitely. this is something that is that happens in, in some countries. It does not happen in the United States. And, and we've had people on the show from Israel, um, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name, who's in charge of that organization now for, for the country, that all martial arts are overseen by the by the country by an organization. No, no, they're not. No, they're not seen. No, they're, they're not, not overseen. No, no, of course not. No. Okay, this no. Is, that's they, what I understood. Right, no, 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 it's correct me. No. Okay, so it is like this. Uh, uh, if you want to have an organization, then you need to build an organization, like association or a company. It doesn't matter. Sure. This goes with government. This everywhere, right? If I want to build an association or a company, different types of company. In the U.S., I need to do it via the state, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So it is the same thing in Israel. That's one thing. What in Israel is true that there is a law, it's called sports law. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to teach, you have to be certified by the sport authorities. This That's is, it. This if you is want what to I teach. was talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So then, and this is true for... Uh, Almost all the sports, not all, not all, but most. Okay. For example, yoga is not under this. Okay. For for some reason, Krav Maga is. It's not exactly correct because we don't have competition really. But uh, let's say it is the, that is the situation. So you have to be authorized by a body who is authorized by the Israeli uh, sport authorities, who is under the Israeli Ministry of education and sport, mm. or culture and sport. It, sometimes it moves sometimes because of politics. So they, by the way, there were years that I was authorized to give diplomas outside Israel. I was the only one mm. to give authorized uh, diplomas by the state of Israel. So all our certificates were the organization certificate plus the certificate from the Israeli government. So then they, they, we finished this uh, option. Uh, so this is this is uh, something that is within within Israel. There are some other countries that is also happening. Yes. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I forget where we, where we were, but let's. Oh, I we, want to I go back. We, we were we were with the organization that yeah. that's what we talked about. Yes. So I built the second organization. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, uh, International Kamaga Federation. So before the first one, Israeli Krav Maga Association it was Israeli. The second one was international, mm -hmm. and then also with some, some of my students. And again, the uh, uh, the human relations went sour a little bit. So I decided, be, and there was uh, no way to control professionally and organization-wise the the people who started with me very young and low level and became masters eventually. So. Usually the masters, uh, the master stays and the students go. I decided that this will not be like this. Then I went. Okay, I didn't want to stay in that one, uh, and I built uh, KMG Kamaga Global. So this was, you know, you can say that I failed in the first two. I'm now in the third. Yes. Very rarely does someone get it right the first time when they do something. Yes. I should have listened to my wife, probably. You know, I don't know exactly what she tells, tell, told me, but probably. <laughs> Wives usually know. Yes. Prior, prior to your involvement with Krav Maga, had you done other martial arts? Were you, had you been interested in martial arts? I was interested. So this is funny because I started uh, learning from a book of Masoyama, mm -hmm. Karate for Young People or Dr Young Dragons or something. I'm not sure what the English name is. I, with a friend. We trained maybe 10, 10 sessions. And then he found the Krav Maga, he started the Krav Maga. And while doing Krav Maga, I did different things. So I did some other martial arts, not a lot, but I did. For example, I did Judo for about two to three years. Mm -hmm. I did uh, something between Karate and Kung Fu for a couple of years. I did uh, Aikido for a couple of years. I did uh, 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 soft Chinese. Uh, Bagua and uh, some some Tai Chi a little bit, uh, more Qi Kong. Uh, I, I don't consider it martial art, but uh, Qi Kong. Um, 
I did uh, when Corona started and we, I couldn't really move much out to Israel. I was bored. So I did uh, BJJ. Mm -hmm. I got the blue belt with one stripe even. Lately, I cannot do it because of some injuries, but uh, uh, I got blue belt maybe after half a year because I did know something about the ground. Yes. And, um, and then uh, some Filipino. I did also a little bit, also a couple of years. Not very viciously, but uh, I did. Yes. So I, I, I do have some overview. And of course, many students of mine were high level in several martial arts, uh, even many. So I got impressions and talking and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that the, the sun shines for my ass, excuse me, for my French. So I listen to the people, I understand the benefits of other styles and man, boxing is the best in boxing. So yes, obviously. So et cetera, et cetera, we understand it. But boxing was like this once, yes? And now it's like this and it changed. You know why? You know why it changed? Gloves. Why? Why to put gloves on? Oh, because people were breaking their hands. Not exactly. No, no, no. Yes, yes, and no. Okay. Let's say before the way it moves, it looks like very much like fencing. So all the boxing was very close to fencing. Okay. Yeah, you look at my wife, tap tap with a glove. I said, "Of uh, 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 spear your heart with a blade that will uh, knock you down with a make you a bloody nose." But uh, the chances of uh, me hitting my knuckles in your dirty mouth when there were, was 100% and there was no Colgate, no Crest, no antibiotics. So what will happen after three weeks? Gangrene, chopped hands, cannot be a boxer with chopped hands. So then I need gloves, that's your right. Then I need gloves, not, not so you will not get hurt. So I will not get hurt, like you said, not to break the knuckles, the, the, the hands, yes, exactly. And um, this was the beginning. And then it came to $100 million for losing. So, of course, you have to be good. <laughs> Imagine, $100 million for losing. I, I, yeah. yeah, I, I, yeah. Would, I would take that fight. I would, I would, I would take, take a fight sure for... I lose, I'll take the money. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Take the fight even for a million. You know what? Right. One of the things that I find fascinating about Krav Maga <clears throat> is when like a lot of other martial arts, but, but maybe more so with Krav Maga, we can see, you talked about the revolutions, the evolutions, this, this progress. Yes. And what I really appreciate it, about it is that a lot, of, a lot of martial arts, I mean, all martial arts borrow, right? They all take movements and techniques from, and concepts from other martial arts, but Krav Maga yeah. seems much more open about the fact that it happened. Oh, we got, okay. we got so this, this came from here, that came from there. Okay, it's not exactly true. Okay. It's not exactly true. Um, so first of all, Israel, we were a bit isolated. You know, practically we are, in a, we are an island. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, surrounded by sea and enemy. Mm -hmm. Now we have some peace processes, but that went on. But uh, overall, we are um, in this specific mentality here. Um, I'm not sure we have time to talk a lot about this, but differently, the subject of uh, uh, Imi's background. For he, his background was boxing and wrestling. Mm -hmm. We never wrestled with him almost at all. We didn't really box with him. We did fighting, but look sparring, like a bit like kickboxing type, mm -hmm. Muay Thai type, MMA type. Imi was MMA, if you think about it, a boxer and a wrestler. But he was fighting in the street on a daily basis. Every day almost. For four years. Every day against the fascists. Most of the time, multiple aggressors. One time he said to me, there, were, there was no time to punch a person twice. So many enemies in that sense. So then he started... Uh, 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 teaching when he, uh, he had a long journey 
very interesting one, obviously. Until he reached Israel, and then a couple of, back then it was Palestine, a couple of years he started teaching in the resistance. There were already some things in the resistance, especially something called Kapap. Not of what is now uh, being called Kapap in, in some, some people revived, some, or let's say called something Kapap now, but it is not the, the real thing that was initially in the defense uh, uh, brigades in Israel, what's called Haganah, the resistance back then. Um, he was teaching knife fighting, defending knife attacks, swimming and lifeguarding. That's how he started. Uh, in, in the resistance. And the resistance was the kapap. Kapap means face-to-face -face combat. Yes, We are joking. In Kav Maga, we say, what happens if he's coming from behind? Okay, you do face-to-face -face combat. Yes. So it was mainly with sticks. So 90% of the work there was sticks and fitness. Um, and we have stick attacks, defending stick Stick and stick, or stick, uh, this, this subject, a couple of levels in the system. So Kapap in Kav Maga is uh, such a relatively small, small section, let's say, what was practically Kapap in the resistance. But uh, uh, Imi started developing his own. Now he was very good with understanding two things. The nature of the aggressor, what we call the attacker, yes, but he's not, uh, he's not the only attacker, yes? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the attacker, yes. Uh, the aggressor, understanding the nature of the aggressor, the nature of the actions of the aggressor, the reactions of the aggressor, he was very much understanding this one, and the natural response of the trainee. Mm -hmm. And on this we build the techniques. So many of the techniques that he had, he just built by himself. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you could see similarities, but it is not the same on one hand, and many things were developed without having the similar, without knowing the, the, the other thing, without knowing uh, Aikido, Karate, Judo, although he, he knew Judo, he learned Judo here. But he did a lot of things before learning any other things, before seeing other things. And he was thinking and visualizing and experimenting. And when he was 80, he was much, way, way better than he was 60. Really? Yes. Of course, not in the, excuse me, not in the technique itself, not in the physical aspects, obviously, but that's what I want to say, not in the physical capabilities, but in understanding and giving the best solutions for the specific problem. Uh, and sometimes, you know, with all the respect, and we were best friends also, uh, he did some really stupid stuff, but he got over it. He understood that things were not suitable. I think that I, can, I made his life very miserable in a way <laughs> that he saw some things were not so good. But, uh, but definitely, uh, he was in a way um, finding the solutions by feeling it. He felt the solution. And many times he could feel the solution without doing. So, so mm -hmm. if he, without, so let's say you come to him and ask, what do you do against uh, certain motion, motion, certain problem? He would give you the answer without doing it before, without experimenting. He felt it in the body. So I was sitting by his bed. He was lying in his bed and I was, you know, we were sitting and talking, yes? Uh, let's say, afternoon meeting, yes? Uh, I would come to his home, and he was in bed reading. So I would go to his room and sit by his bed and talk, and we talk, and I was discussing something. He would, I, I could see it in his eyes how uh, uh, things click there. And he would tell me an answer or a direction or an instruction while sitting. And you know, when I met him, he was 64. When I met him, I was 50. So when I was very close to him, let's say he was 71, I was 90, uh, 22. This is when we started to work together. Uh, so he, he was, uh, I, I didn't reach yet, I'm 65 now. I, I didn't reach yet 
uh, uh, I've reached the age that he was when I met him. I didn't reach the age that he was, uh, let's say, at his prime with understanding his, himself. And I can tell you that this is what is happening when you are doing things so many years. You feel it. You are, you are the spirit of it. You are entering the spirit of it. You know, uh, this, is, this, is what is, this is what is happening when you're doing something so profoundly so many years. And any other talent, obviously. How long has he been gone now? He died in 98. So 26 oh years, yeah. 26 years, yes. What do, you, what do you think he'd be saying about where, what Krav Maga is today? Well, he was amazed when already when we were in the last stage of his life when he saw what we were doing. Already then, with the principles and the variations and the tactics, he was already amazed back then. And uh, but he saw that he was the foundation, he was the ground, and he saw how we build the skyscrapers on his ground, something like this, or the pyramids on his ground, uh, on his base, let's say. Uh, I think uh, he would be very happy with the spreading of the system. He would be very disappointed with the, the fakes that are out there, with the wannabes with the people who are saying that they are doing Krav Maga and they do uh, more or less the opposite of Krav Maga. And they are saying that they are doing Krav Maga, unfortunately. Opposite. Uh, they, they take the long route. They, they, do, they don't understand the problem. They don't understand the solution. They do solutions that are, um, let's say, the opposite than what he was be doing. Yes. And they are saying it's Krav Maga. So, yes, people are learning, obviously, and you, you cannot cheat all the people all the time, but you can cheat most of the people most of the time, you know. And this is what's happening, unfortunately. Do you know how many Kung Fu styles there are? Oh. I, I heard that thousands. So the, we are not yet in the thousands, but uh, um, Krav Maga is the system. Krav Maga is the way. The t way of teaching Krav Maga is part of Krav Maga. So if people are not on that highway, yes, we can be in the left lane and the right lane. We can slow down. We can change a vehicle. We can go to a motorcycle or to a old Corvette, you know, or to a, to a new Audi or whatever. But we are still on the highway. And there are people who are going on a side track to some other direction, completely opposite, if you could say. So... Uh, this is this is frustrating, um, and and uh, may I tell you something about this? Please, please. So, my because students. I've seen this. I, I've, yeah. you know, in in most martial arts, you know, yes. fifty years, and there will yes. be splintering. Oh right? shoot! Yes. And yes. it tends to get worse the further we get from the founder's death. Yes. Right. Yes. So you had yes. you had lots of time with Emi. So yes. people can, can argue maybe, no, this was the way, but it's really hard to argue with you given that you had 50, 60, 50 years with 20, him? 20, 24 years with him. 24 years with him. Okay. Yes. As, um, as, as the yeah, student. Then, yeah. 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 24 yeah. years with him. Really nobody else is going to have a better perspective than you. So if you say this is what Amy wanted or, or meant or what it's, it's. Or let's say what I thought he meant. <laughs> Fair enough. I have, to be, I have to be honest in this one also. And humble. Yes. He was humble. Uh, okay, so uh, instructors of mine would come to me and say about uh, a certain person or a certain place that they are teaching faith Krav Maga. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them, look, they are murderers, they are, key, they are rapists, they are drug dealers. Okay, big deal. Somebody is teaching Do your best to show the people what is the best. At least that's what we know. And that's it. Maybe they can punch us down in two minutes. It's not Krav Maga. Okay? And I, what I wanted people to focus is on uh, their best work and not to be uh, disturbed by the fake ones. 
but fake ones, obviously, or, or, or the bad ones that are giving bad names. So it's not a good competition. It's a bad name, and it is ruining the name. And partly, in part, some part, uh, by some martial artists, the Kamaga name is ruined uh, uh, because they think, oh, it's just bullshit. Because what they saw, they saw bullshit, so they think about bullshit. Uh, mm. That's what that, the conclusion. Anyhow, one time, while talking this to one of the guys, I just recalled uh, a fable from uh, a very excellent uh, storyteller from Russia named Krylov. Ivan Krylov, if I remember correctly. If I'm, uh, this is amazing. He has amazing stories. He's a 18th century, 19th century. Uh, very much against the regime back then of the Tsar and all this. And, the, and here the, the story was like this. Two souls reach hell. One is a scholar and a writer and a philosopher, and the other one is a criminal. Okay? Uh, and they are being put into some uh, pots, and uh, under the criminal, there's inferno, strong fire, and then the, the, the philosopher, small fire. So the criminal is... Uh, tortured and shouting for one day, for two days, for one week, for two weeks, one month, two months, consumed, gone. Was tortured for a couple of months, gone. Under the philosopher, small fire. One day, one month, one year, one decade. After one generation, it's of course uh, burning like hell. And he's shouting and screaming and and two or three generations, he's being uh, uh, decades, whatever you call it. He's, he's uh, tortured, and he's complaining to the chief, which Madeira, why am I in this suffering while the criminal suffered a couple of weeks, and that's it. She tells him, your poison is still on earth, poisoning people. Okay. So sometimes, you know, teaching the wrong stuff is... Uh, is uh, Worse than hell. I agree with Jordan Peterson. That, that's, that is a powerful thought. And, and yes. uh, for, for, for folks who might be listening rather than, than watching, it doesn't seem to bother you that much, which, which I think says, says something pretty, pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the folks that we have in the audience... Yes. Yes. are not Krav Maga practitioners. In fact, there's most of the folks we have in the audience are not any one thing. It's, it's, it's all over the place. And sure. one of the questions I'll often ask is what do you wish the, the practitioners of other martial arts might learn and take from Krav Maga and bring into what they do? Okay. First of all, we are a system. And um, in, that is going in a specific direction. Mm -hmm. Direction is deal with reality. How to deal with the confrontation, how to deal with the stress of the confrontation, with the chaos of the confrontation, of event like this, I mean, I mean physical confrontation, which usually many times starts as a non-physical non, non and then becomes violent and physical. Understanding the timeline, understanding the tactics, uh, understand the vast system that is built uh, uh, on uh, very simple principles, very simple foundations, but became very large and very efficient. Um, I think that people can learn from us the way to the way how to train people, how to prepare people, especially for reality. I mean, I'm not so good in preparing people for fighting in the ring. Yes. Uh, I can teach the tactics that we have. They will be very suitable and very powerful for this type of uh, competitors in the ring or in, a, in, a, in a, uh, any type of the mats and competitions, for sure. But it's not aimed like this. It's obviously that I'm, I cannot box as good as the boxer. But if I'm being challenged by a boxer, the main thing will be 
to not to fight, obviously. That's the first thing. Not to, to prevent, to uh, avoid. You win. Okay. I'll buy you a beer. Yes. I'll buy you a Coke. Um, and this, this is the first thing. And if I need to fight a boxer, uh, definitely I will do all the things that he is not used to do. And what's illegal in boxing? Obviously, I'll try to kick, I'll use a chair, I'll bite his ear, no, I'll bite his nose. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. This, 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 uh, 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 I'll do all the, the things I need in order to win this situation. And not to get into in jail. Yes. So there is so much to learn from what we do, uh, except the technical aspect. Even the way to the, the way of teaching, how to uh, connect the different techniques. I have uh, students of mine, for example, uh, one of our uh, uh, experts uh, is the head of our branch in Italy. He started the BJJ, if I remember correctly, at the same time he started Krav Maga. So he's a BJJ black belt. And he teaches, teaches BJJ like teaching Krav Maga. He doesn't teach BJJ like teaching BJJ. He said the way of teaching Krav Maga is way, way better. You can't even compare the teaching processes and the understanding of how to bring people to the best level in the shortest time. Uh, but, of course, he's teaching BJJ, but the way he's teaching is the methods that is borrowed from us. This that is an example. Yes. Okay. And the, the scientific uh, mindset, the scientific way of thinking, the analyzing of technique, the understanding principles. I've not seen this in, in, in any other place uh, at least not in this magnitude. I see a glimpse of things, yes, but not in the, that level. The, the biggest revolution that I see in martial arts overall right now is yes. in improving teaching methods. Okay, so, so we are a couple of generations forward. You're, you're, at, you're ahead, but finally yes. people are saying, how do we teach this better, right? Because you can't answer the question until you ask the question. But now a lot of people are asking the question and there are a yes. lot of resources out there and it, it's... People, yes. people are, are open now, and I think that's great. Yes. I, I like you know that when I started doing the first uh, seminars in Europe, and there were, I approached only martial artists. By the way, there was no internet back then. So we approached only martial artists. And I would give a seminar, and people from all levels and all uh, systems I mean, that were in the area came. And sometimes 50, 60, 70 people in a seminar and half of them wanted to become Maga instructors after the, uh, in the end of the seminar. So this was the, the result. Yeah. And it was the, it, there was a package. The package was, it's clear. What you teach, how you teach, and who is teaching. Mm -hmm. the, the system, the transfer, and the instructor. That's it. So... Uh, uh, that's how, what people saw. And many people were, uh, back then, older than me, <laughs> which is not so common now. Uh, and many people were really high level, and even champions in their own country or in Europe or Australia, you know, things like this. Mm. South America. What do you hope for the next generation of Krav Maga? What, what... I'm sure you hope it continues to improve and progress, but yes. do you have specific thoughts on how that might happen? If I would know, I, I would already be there. This is obvious. Okay. Uh, but what I would like is definitely the people to dwell, dig into it. Uh, uh, improve themselves, understand the principles, uh, not focus only on techniques. To focus on techniques is usually what common people are doing. To understand the efficiency of things. This is uh, what, what, is, what is needed. And then uh, definitely different uh, avenues. For example, um, professionals. 
So more in the military, more in the police. They really need it, obviously. And they need to save lives, not only their own lives, save other people's life, other people's lives. Not only on the third party and VP protection, but also not to shoot, because they can manage without shooting. Things like this. Not to be stressed, because they manage to do the stress, to deal with the stress. To work much more on the mental aspect. And we have since uh, 2000, really, we have uh, training for managers, high-level managers, directors. Uh, and we were going in different avenues. Until Corona, it was OK. Uh, now, after Corona, we, we didn't do much with it. But we have uh, specific courses for mental aspects, for mental training, even three days mental training for uh, managers or people from the military and the police and people coming from the martial art industry. This is like a, a general courses like this, but also we have specific courses for managers. And because they are leaders, I think it's very important that they will go through it. And we use Krav Maga in our mental training and physical training and technical and tactical to increase their understanding of the mainly deal with stress, understand what is stress, deal with stress, get uh, methods to reduce the stress, um, and I could talk uh, three days now about this, but you have not so much time. Maybe next time we'll talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we can we can book a three day session. We'll, we'll, yeah. I'll I'll bring snacks. Okay, but maybe I'm not sure what your organization is doing. But if your organization is doing any type of seminars, maybe we can do something together. That would be great. That would be great. Yes. Yeah. See if we can make yeah. that happen. If yeah. people want to get a hold of you or learn more about Krav Maga and, and KMG, where would they go online? Okay, so we have our main site is www.krav- the minus the middle line maga.com. Okay. My name uh, with my email, so eyal at krav-maga.com. And if they will be good friends, I'll give them my phone number later. Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to have you close us up and, and give some final thoughts. But to the audience, you know, go check out the website. And, and, you know, one of the things I find interesting is that a lot of traditional martial artists think of Krav Maga and they think it, it is something that is so dramatically different. And, it, and for some schools, it is. But what I've witnessed is that a lot of martial arts schools see a lot of what they already do in what my understanding at least of Krav Maga is, and I find that really fascinating. So um, don't be afraid to look around, whether it's it's in this context or or others. But um, you know, thank, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. And, and what what are your final words to the audience today? Oh, if you want me, I, will, can, I can say something long. We've got time. Okay. So I think the, the main thing in what you do in general in life you need to have the faith, trust, and belief, first of all. And I've been preaching this to my students, and I got it mainly from my yoga teacher. Uh, faith is in the abstract, which means faith in the knowledge, faith in the system, faith in the organization, faith in the company you're working for. This is the faith. Trust is the trust in the intermediate, in the instructor, in the boss, in the teacher, in the priest, in the rabbi. Okay. This is the trust. Trust in the person who is between you and the abstract. If you think about martial art, the knowledge, you need to, have to develop faith in the knowledge. Some of the knowledge is crooked, unfortunately. Some of the knowledge was uh, taught like teaching the enemy. For example, after World War II, uh, things were uh, taught in Japan, like teaching the enemy. You Americans were the enemy. You conquered them, so they taught you the wrong stuff, obviously. What will happen if I need to teach Hezbollah? Food, food, food. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, the faith. This is the knowledge. Ne knowledge to be as needs to be right, correct, deep as possible. That is the first. The second is the trust in the. Now we are talking about martial arts. So the instructor, the instructor who wants to bring you to the highest level possible. And we have in Hebrew saying. Man or person should not be envy with his students or with his uh, children. So you need to bring your students higher level than you are. That's your aim, obviously. And don't be narcissistic and don't put 
uh, uh, sticks in their wheels. Yes, that they need to be better than you are, so it can continue. In many ways, I'm much better than Imi. Of course, he, again, he did everything. He was much better than me in some things. But in doing what I'm doing, I'm much better. It's another generation. It's uh, suitable completely for, and the new generations I already see much better than me in some things. Uh, so uh, this is the trust in the instructor. And then you can develop the belief in yourself. You gain the experience. You gain the courage. Courage. Uh, you gain. You're gaining the self-efficacy. You believe in yourself, and it is improving you. It is giving you uh, a better uh, abilities, better results than if you don't believe in yourself. So this is what we want to develop in our trainees that they will believe in themselves. They will have a higher level of efficacy. And then the highest level of results. And we should not be envying the results. So in that case, faith, trust, believe. The experience, the courage, the understanding, the self-efficacy, the highest level of results. This is the chain. And this we need to do in whatever we do in life. That's my humble opinion. And that's what I'm trying to preach to the guys.